Thank you. We're having a joint presentation on this paper today because my partner in the paper, Dr. Kareem, did all the work. So uh, I'm here to just present uh, sort of how we, we got involved and he's going to give you the details of uh, all of the technical aspects of the uh, design of the sloshing dampers. What we're finding here is uh, the, the title, as you see, is for slender concrete towers. And we're finding more and more very slender concrete towers being proposed and built. And uh, we're discovering that uh, much of the, many of the assumptions that go with the analysis of those towers is still uh, not clear especially the assumption on how much damping to have when you're originally doing your analysis. Uh, a difference of one or two percent makes the difference as to whether you have to do damping or not uh, in many cases. And uh, that's what we've found in these, case, in these studies that we've done here. Uh, the, the first couple of slides, you'll see many of this, these, this type of presentation throughout the conference. Uh, yes, we're doing more and more tall buildings, and not many of them are being done in the U.S. Most of them are being done in Asia, as you well know, and uh, we won't spend too much time on that. Uh, also, the distribution of where they are, more and more tall, very tall residential buildings. I don't know if you've seen some of the articles in recent New York papers where uh, the super, not quite super tall, but still very tall for New York City, are are going, uh, being built, and they're going for in the neighborhood of five to six thousand dollars a square foot in terms of uh, sale price of these condos. Uh, certainly out of the price range of most of us in this room, but uh, that's actually happening. Uh, the projects are being built, they're being approved, and uh, it's the residential again is uh, taking hold over the office space. The design considerations. Uh, this slide just gives you the, gr the big overview, Survival survivability, obviously strength, and then serviceability, and that is the, the area we're focusing on, the human comfort area, which uh, in many cases can be uh, a gray area as to what is an acceptable or not acceptable uh, response level. Then, of course, non-structural, which is the uh, cladding and other uh, mechanical equipment issues. The standard that we judge most of the buildings by are the RMS uh, acceleration response and uh, again that depending on the frequency of the building there's various levels of acceptable RMS uh, response. Other Firms have other uh, criteria that may be acceptable, and uh, it, it varies also for office or residential or uh, other types of uses. Again, this is a criteria that uh, when, you, when you're doing the preliminary design, which is what I do most of the time, conceptual design of the tower, you want to be able to zero in on, on a, a, an acceptable criteria and at least be in the ballpark. This, uh, this is a schematic that Asan put together. Sh sort of shows what I've done in a lot of uh, cases where I've been brought in as a consultant, probably mainly because of my gray hair and some of the young guys want to have some opinion that uh, has been doing this for a while. But one of, the, one of the easier ways of trying to get a handle on what the acceleration response of a complicated tower would be is to just uh, not go right into the wind tunnel. Uh, no offense to the wind tunnel people, but we, we do like to calculate things. And Notre Dame has come up with this, uh, this website that I find quite uh, useful. And even though the building shape may not fit uh, the exact format of what's, what's in the, the website, uh, you can usually provide another level of modifications before you go in. But it will give you a rough idea if you're in the ballpark uh, with your uh, building response in terms of wind action. I find it quite useful. It gets 
has got me to uh, numbers that are close enough for preliminary design purposes, uh, knowing whether you have a big problem, little problem, or no problem. And that's sort of what I look at when I'm trying to design a system for a tower. This, uh, uh, if, you're, if your format doesn't fit, you call us on, he'll tell you what factor to apply to maybe modify the results for a different shape or height. But it is quite useful, and it's based on uh, uh, a, a wide variety of uh, database that gives you a, a good approximation of, of what the uh, acceleration response might be. With that in mind, uh, that's, that's essentially uh, the, the preliminary design approach for wind accelerations. Obviously, you have to do your, your strength and other issues, but this takes some of the, uh, the, the, the mystery out of uh, wind motion, I think. It's been very helpful in my uh, uh, work for uh, doing the preliminary designs and uh, system de designs, along with the other key factor, which is the height to width ratio of the structural system that you're looking at. And today we're, we're looking at a couple of buildings. One, the, uh, the project in Manila, which if you measure from the foundations, it has a height to width ratio of 13. And uh, that's very slender. Uh, all I needed to hear was that, and I knew there was probably gonna be motion problems. Uh, the one in Dallas is, uh, is not quite as tall, but equally slender in its structural system. Uh, but it has a height to width ratio, I think in the range of 10. Um, that, is the introduction that I needed to provide. And um, this slide gives you the, the standard uh, structural systems and standard approach that uh, we all use. Uh, but we're gonna focus here basically on the, on the orange uh, diagram here of auxiliary damping systems. And once you have um, information from the wind tunnel or from the schematic design system that uh, the uh, website gives you, uh, you then go into auxiliary damping systems, of which there are many kinds, but what we're finding is that the sloshing dampers uh, utilizing water um, are really becoming very practical simply because they're very economical. And yes, they do indeed take some space on the higher floors, but uh, when you're talking with developers and they're doing the trade-off of a, another condo or, or millions of dollars on a different mechanical system, they opt for the water slosher. Um, and uh, it usually just comes down to economics as, uh, as opposed to which one is best. With that, I'd like to uh, turn things over to Dr. Karim, who, I, again, I want to emphasize did most of the work on this, so uh, he will take, take us through the detailed applications of the sloshing dampers. Okay, thank you very much. I think we had a very good uh, lesson in history this morning about how architecturally shapes evolved and the buildings evolved. Let me give you those of you who have heard sloshing dampers. Uh, in early 80s, I was playing with a graduate student of a problem in which a building had a <coughs> pool on the top floor. And we need to see when the spillover takes place if there was an earthquake. While playing with the height of the water in the swimming pool and looking at the response of the building, all of a sudden it was acting like a tune mass damper. And that's sort of a birth of tune sloshing dampers in structural engineering. And later we found out that there were people in aerospace engineering were also doing similar things with sloshing of uh, liquids to control the motion of satellites. Uh, but both things were sort of happening at the same time. Uh, so I think there are other options we have, but as we just decided that we're gonna use tune sloshing damper, which acts very much like a TMD, tune mass damper, but the difference is in this case, the mass is not fixed. It depends on the level of motion, how much water is gonna be take part in, the, in, in controlling uh, the motion. So uh, there are various advantages and disadvantages. I think Bob has uh, already said some. I think ease in installation, if you don't like it, you can drain it and use that space for some other purpose rather than having a fixed mechanical system. But I think uh, there is definitely some disadvantages too because water is not as heavy as steel uh, ball you can hang. 
so you need a lot of space for that one. And there are some issues sometimes with the water sitting on the top floor of the building. The other thing is for designing a tune mass damper, you can design over the back of an envelope with a very good accuracy because there are a lot of literature is av available in mechanical engineering systems where you can have uh, the tuning and everything done because the mass is fixed, everything is under control. In case of water, as I said, it depends on the level of the building motion, how much mass is going to participate of water in going back and forth. Again, the surface is free, so the waves are going to form. They're going to be nonlinear interaction takes place, which you don't want. Uh, as a designer, we should be able to control or tame the motion in the water in such a way that it remains as close to linear as possible. If that can be done, I think we are in good shape. In order to design this, uh, and those of you who are in the audience have designed tune sloshing dampers, uh, can understand that there's a lot of iterative procedure done because it's a nonlinear system. Every displacement level of the building would have a different uh, reactive force caused by this water uh, sloshing on the walls of the tank. So in order to go, we have developed this uh, portal, which is a design portal, which can be done in time domain if you have a time, uh, histories of loads for building from wind tunnel, or if you like to use spectral approach, which Bob just mentioned, from the wind tunnel or any other source. And also screen design. I will mention that in order to tame the motion of water in the tank, we insert screens. And those screen design is, again, a nonlinear fluid mechanics problem because water is passing back and forth from those uh, uh, screen masses. So in order to avoid all the hassle, we have captured everything in this portal, which has a humongous background mathematics which goes on. But for me, it's a lot easier to plug numbers and play, and you can do a lot of iterations without uh, spending a lot of uh, time on uh, running various uh, computer programs. So this is just to give you uh, an overview of uh, what it is this. So the first building we dealt is a 72-story building in uh, Manila, and the wind tunnel study uh, suggested that there needs to be some, uh, uh, the damping needs to be enhanced a little bit because we were getting close to a margin where uh, the, this building could have been in uh, some uh, human uh, comfort issue. And again, in case of concrete building, those of you who have designed and been in those, at these uh, serviceability amplitude level, because there's not much of a cracking going on, we, the damping is very uncertain, and so is the natural frequency. We have monitored in our group several tall buildings in the world, and the steel buildings are very easy to predict the natural frequency, but with the concrete, we have a lot of issues because it depends how much, what is the moment of inertia and what is the E value in a building. So in this particular case, uh, we have this uh, sloshing damper. Once we design the sloshing damper, we always have to test it like others do in the business. And uh, you make a scale model of that and uh, you insert screens and then you put it on a or sort of a shaking table, depends on it is a unidirectional or bidirectional. In this particular case, it's a bidirectional because this has two orthogonal degrees of motion. Uh, so if you only put a tank on the shaking table, you only find out how your tank is behaving. Your building is not part of it. So the next step, which normally we do, before I get to that, just to give you some idea how much reduction uh, we have. This is a radial direction, and tangential direction is along that particular direction. We have reduced acceleration by 22% and 21% uh, in uh, this particular case. Uh, so, so here you can see some of the water profile. When we don't have any screens in there, you see a lot of uh, different wave or higher harmonics of sloshing are taking place. By inserting the screens, the, thing, the behavior is a little more tamed, and you don't see the higher components as much. You cannot totally eliminate them, but I think you can make their role or their contribution uh, uh, rather small. Uh, in case of Dallas, uh, again, it's a very high aspect ratio building, and uh, there was an issue with the, with, the, with the comfort level in this building also, or a borderline case. Uh, people, like in an earlier session, there was people take it for granted that most all buildings made out of concrete have 2% damping, or at least many people design that way, but these dampings are much lower than that one. So to avoid or eliminate that uncertainty, what is the value of damping? If you have a damper system, then you know how much you're gonna tailor, how much you're gonna add, and you will have a much better. Uh, so we designed it based on our uh, uh, software portal we had. And one unique thing about this is to be more uh, uh, carefully utilize the space 
We had a double decker and four tanks arrangement in this particular case. So we have, uh, uh, as you can see, they are stacked on top of each other. And uh, this provides us a more compact space rather than taking uh, too much space. So to my knowledge, I think this is the only double decker configuration, but I may be wrong because I'm not totally aware of what is uh, various new developments are going through. Uh, in this case, again, we have 30 to 40 percent reduction in the response of this building. So I think if you can reduce 30 to 40 percent response of building, uh, that is uh, very comfortable for human being and also I think for those who are spending money on these buildings. Uh, so the next stage is that uh, we have designed the tank, how good it is. So either you can take this tank numerically, the way we have modeled it and couple it with a structural dynamics model of the building from ETABS, or you have to demonstrate the effectiveness using a, a physical model of that. And also you have to use, uh, find out how much force is acting on the screen because a lot of water is moving back and forth and you have to design those screens also. If they're not properly done, you will have uh, an issue with that as well. So uh, you can uh, d d d ascertain the scale you're going to use for the tank uh, and uh, also, and I'll show you how we have done in measuring the screen force. And the last thing is that you have to actually demonstrate physically your building and your sloshing damper. So others have used uh, very long uh, uh, pendulums on which represents the building. And then in that pendulum, they put the tank. And then uh, you have to put a lot of mass also to the building because you want to keep the water mass ratio and the building ratio to a level that you can really understand how things are going on. So to avoid all that elimination, here's an innovation we came up about 10 years ago is uh, what is called hardware in the loop. Uh, aerospace industry uses that. And more recently, earthquake engineering community is using it, which they call it as a hybrid testing. The essence of this thing is that uh, you, uh, here is the whole system. Uh, you model the, the sloshing damper, which is a nonlinear system, on physically. And this is put on shaking table. In between the two, there's a force balance. And then you speak in real time with a computer model of the structure, because that is always going to be in the linear domain. So just to look at, uh, this is the physical setup we have. And uh, as I just said before, people have uh, used this or many other different variation of this one, but we feel that uh, to model the structure itself, which is represented by this big uh, pendulum and a small sloshing damper in there, can have some uh, issues uh, with it. So here is uh, a more schematic view of uh, a virtual structure, physical tank, and they talk in real time to each other, and you get a uh, pretty good uh, response. So here is more than those who are interested in mathematics, uh, all these equations, and you got external force as well as a net sloshing force, which comes out of from our base uh, balance in there. So in this uh, particular case, we used a smaller tank, 1 to 20, because if you have 1 to 10 scale, you've got a pretty large tank. So we, we utilize this 1 to 20 scale model, which works quite well in this particular case. So we tried some sinusoidal and random wind loading, and uh, the reduction uh, was pretty reasonable in this particular case. Uh, the target uh, value of damping and the damping ratio of building is one, and we were able to reduce uh, the acceleration. Just to show you some of the results, and as you can <coughs> see, we had uh, three different cases of uh, excitation in uh, sinusoidal loads, and as you can see, the middle case where the tuning is very close to the natural frequency, we see the maximum effect, and why we see the maximum effect, as you can see, the tank motion, the building motion and the sloshing force are exactly or very close to 180 degree out of phase. Once you are detuned, that uh, is not as good as you can see in this particular case. These are some more cases, as you can see. Uh, these are the random uh, filtered white noise, which is representing more like wind loading on structures. And once again, when you can see red is, uh, is our uh, reduction in force, uh, in response, uh, acceleration and blue is without. Uh, we also like to see what is the damping. We suddenly stopped our system and let it decay, and that was a very good way to find out what was the net damping we're adding. We're almost adding, uh, in this particular case, 3%, 1%, depending on how we are doing things. So just to uh, close, uh, this is uh, uh, a summary of uh, experience uh, with two real tall towers. 
which were, uh, we call them uh, with the dampers, aqua sloshers technology, uh, which is, uh, one of them is a bi-directional, other is a unidirectional, because there was no need in the Dallas case to control both directions of motion. We utilized numerical methods to model these things, and then we verified that individually for the tank, and then we also verified for the tank and the building using this uh, novel approach, which is hybrid approach or uh, hardware in the loop, which worked very successfully in really delineating what is the role of each force and what is it that doing uh, to the building. And, uh, and the bottom line is that uh, with all the, the inclusion of this tune sloshing dampers, the building response has been reduced. So there is a no issue of uh, human comfort, even though the buildings were a borderline case. Uh, and due to uncertainty in damping, uh, we had to uh, introduce these damping devices. The next phase is right now, which is currently in progress in the Dallas building, that we have sent our instrumentation over there, which is uh, connected to the building, and we are monitoring that building, how that building is uh, performing. Particularly the interest there is, what is the natural frequency of the building really? Because we are using just the ETAPS value. So based on the natural frequency, which will be monitored in these wind velocity range, we will be able to retune our tank as would be quite uh, obvious to change. Uh, the water height is the only option left because the walls are already fixed. And we can also tune some of the damping if need arises because the screening system is such that it is, we can change the spacing of uh, the slats uh, of the two levels. And uh, as far as the Manila building, that is uh, not to that stage yet because the building is not totally done. And I think in the next few months uh, we will be uh, installing our instrumentation over there also to fine tune the, the natural frequency and what actually is the damping and how much are we going to hand over when we are all done with this. With that, I thank you for the attention. Thank you.